state of Missouri as colorful barns continue to illuminate the canvas right here on The Creative Connection. You probably won't see me paint on a canvas turned upside down very often, although it happens on occasion. It's a watercolor technique used as a means of controlling the paint, especially in the case of painting the skyline where the lighter colors begin at the horizon, turning darker toward the sky. Since it's more difficult to push the flow of watercolors density upward, turning the canvas upside down allows the paint to flow into its optimum fluidity, making a smooth transition from light to dark. And when used with pointed brushes, this technique enables us to maneuver the bristles of the brush away from the hard edge of clouds, as well as to create a distinct edge for the horizon. It's okay to borrow from other techniques. Here I'm using acrylic paints. But the bottom line to any venture such as this is to keep the paint from getting muddy. Even though the sky was clear on this day, I recall a few clouds in the distance where along with the moment the sky seemed to be rather misty, with a haze. Either way you'd want to look at it, I'm not about to let the sky become the focus of this event, especially when it becomes as simple as this. Once the horizon has been established, you can work more freely in covering those things such as clouds, trees, and I suppose a few birds flying along if you want to include them. Nevertheless, try to make sure this is the way you want to leave it. Any attempt to make changes after painting in details most likely will be futile. In order to continue on with smooth transitions, I try to remain skeptical about certain areas I have sketched, suggesting only an approximate road map for details to follow. This kind of anticipation is very much a part of the enjoyment we get from painting with the premise to do it and see what happens. I don't think it's regimented at all in the case of those who like to say, I do it for the fun of it. If you can't have fun with it, you best find something else to do. During the planning stage, when this project became the barn on the way to the fishing hole, it soon became apparent I would have to deal with the overgrown weeds and grasses that had all but taken over the premises. And on top of that, though it didn't bother me as much, I noticed a thorn tree had grown up right smack dab in the middle of the barn's perspective, which meant that I would have to paint the tree on the face of the barn I had so painstakingly already established. I suppose it's only natural for us to feel our way through the cost of progress, as I soon found myself headlong in debate with the alternative. Why not simply create a lush green pasture merged with a neatly mowed ditch bank? After all, we artists hold the license to interpret change in pursuit of provoking a response. Why waste time and aggravation with insignificant weeds, along with a sapling that sprang up out of the middle of nowhere? Wouldn't you know it, the weeds won out, thus creating another dilemma. Where on earth would I find a brush that could deal with such a difficult task? With watercolor, for example, the pointed ends of brushes are used for most detail, but with acrylic paint, the brushes are much thicker in negating the rough, gessoed canvas. Well, needless to say, the technique of using pointed brushes soon met its demise. But after I began trying out my arsenal of various brushes, I was caught up in the use of a small, worn-out brush with a curve on the tip that would trail in the lines I so desperately needed. After that, it wasn't so difficult. But it wasn't easy except in the fact weeds would be taking over everything, including the very noticeable gate I had slogged my way through, only to be overtaken in the end by a batch of goldenrod and unwanted ivy. So, rather than change the composition to create a neater picture, I accepted the greater challenge in the hopes of achieving a more dimensionalized effect. As I began working my way out of the painting by completing the foreground, 
I could see how the efforts had paid off. Having an open gate, inviting us to step inside. A safe, yet rocky tour through no man's land. On the road to the barn, on the way to the fishing hole. It took a while finding anything of significance regarding the companion piece. But during the process of adding a few specific details, I managed to single out the area at the back of the barn that had two gates. It certainly didn't take long to decide upon the title of two gates, as I began gathering up the devices I'd need to build in relief, or having depth being built out from the wall. I used a one-quarter inch wooden dowel rod to make the gates, cutting them to their proper length and width, notching out where they meet, then gluing them together where the closer end of the gate would emerge out of the canvas and the reverse end would be embedded to the flat surface. With the belt sander, I proceeded to sand off the back side of the gate with a slant by applying more pressure so that the closer end would be left in the round while the other end would become flat. It worked very well, and in a short while, I had the gate secured in their proper place. For the post at the far right, I used a one-half inch wooden dowel, and for the other brace pieces, I picked through some scraps I had sawed out from another project. It's interesting that when you first notice this arrangement, it appears to be the ruins of another gate that had fallen apart or deteriorated over time. However, I soon figured out it was a brace built at the end of a fence used to stretch the wire, generally with a block and tackle. At one time or another, we used to stretch the wire with a tractor, or sometimes even a pickup. Anyway, after the wire was stretched, it was a simple matter of nailing it to the post, where the braces would keep the fence tight and straight after completion. Here the back side of these pieces were also sanded to achieve dimension on the flat surface. The large cedar tree that had grown up in and around the gates presented a challenge in determining the type of material I would use to create the raised surface. There are many different products on the market today that would have been okay to try, but I wasn't interested in trying new products, especially if I didn't know for sure how they would work. If I had used modeling paste, as I have in the past, it probably would have chipped, causing problems. I have used different epoxy glues before, but sometimes they're unpredictable in their mixtures and drying times. Without proper ventilation, they can be rather toxic. So in my efforts to find the right material, this wood welding type of epoxy soon became the preferred medium, as it dried quickly and when hardened it became super tough. It worked perfectly for what I had in mind. After I had applied gesso, making the canvas ready for painting, as with all relief paintings I have done, it looked appropriate to leave it as it was. I don't know exactly why, but I believe it has something to do with mixed media, where in this case, sculpture demands dominance over painting, and would have probably won out, except for the elaborate planning and overall message with a meaning of becoming a companion piece, where one painting supports the other. Though it all seemed to come together quite easily, and to a certain extent, this painting doesn't rank high on any scale of difficulty. Reality posed as abstract design has earned this work its place as a unique companion piece to The Barn on the Way to the Fishing Hole. Regarding the medium of painting, I have heard and have said on several occasions, we artists paint paint. In other words, we don't paint clouds, trees, or in the previous painting, a ditch bank full of weeds. We paint paint. Well, the reality of what we do often comes down to the length of time and patience we have in order to complete a painting that may very well end with the statement, isn't this weed bed ever going to end? So I guess what I'm trying to say is that it's not necessarily the canvas or technique that determines when a painting is complete, as much as perhaps the final words of the artist that might say, I think I've had about enough of this. And he basically stops, only to anticipate the beginning of another one, where in this case, the dairy barn, 
may symbolize the Cadillac of barns completed thus far. It does represent a few comfort levels found more pleasing than in the other paintings, beginning with a very pleasant sky with a few puffy clouds floating about on a bright, sunny day. It all takes me back to the numerous times and events where I have driven past some of these barns on the way to the famed Trailer State Park, taking a few photographs. Someone asked recently, you paint from photographs, don't you? I said, indeed I do take a lot of photographs, as many as I can. Several changes took place during the year that passed. As I photographed this barn from time to time, the huge tree in the front had been taken out, although I could still have painted it in. The photographs served as an excellent reference point. Yes, any reference is as good as gold. Regardless of how an artist achieves his objective, it still becomes a matter of doing it. Each roof was basically done the same. However, for the most part, their added tints of blue along with shades of gray reflect the sun's intensity. Thus, the lighter reflections would indicate a hotter temperature. From the viewer's eye, the closer roofs would appear cooler, leaning toward a greater saturation of blue. The ridges of the roof were significant to shadows, blocking out direct reflections translated as thick lines parallel to one another. The reflectiveness of the sun's energy is apparent on the roof's edges as the paint is peeled away from the blistering gray of the wood. Due to the changes in architectural styles, the normal tin roof has been replaced recently by steel metal fabrication. As I begin painting the windows, I realize window panes for some may represent a challenge concerning whether to let the paint take its course or to be more precise by first painting them their color, then masking them off to paint the darkened areas. This technique allows me to organize the windows, for indeed they may have been all done the same way. Each window has its own personality in the end. The look of worn out paint was first achieved in the effects of shadows underneath the roof overhangs, where white represents the color of the barn before it was painted red, and gray is descriptive of blistering, showing the bare wood. This particular shade of red was pre-mixed, so there'd be enough to do the entire project. Whether mixed as a shade or tint, it remains consistent from section to section. The color of the foundation was also pre-mixed to provide specific color throughout, where upon completion we find, guess what, more weeds. Although this weed bed isn't quite so dominant over the grass already established, in the grooming of such a place as a dairy barn, things have to be a little more up to standards than normal. After all, if these cows are to produce, they must be treated accordingly, keeping them and their surroundings as clean as possible. This huge tree may have been planted here soon after the barn's construction. At any rate, if trees could talk, I'm sure this one would have some very interesting stories to tell. With our imagination, we could easily envision our way back to the neighborhood milkman and his timely deliveries. I would go as far as to say, by the looks of it, there may have been cheese production here, including distribution as well as pasteurization. That may have been just a little before my time, though. At any rate, I must tell the story about the time I worked at the college farm as a milker. Along the edge of the sidewalk on the way down to the milking parlor grew some of the finest sweet potatoes in all of southeast Missouri, planted and cared for by Dr. Mark Scully, president of the university. One morning I forgot to close the door of the holding pen, so the cows gingerly tromped through the sweet potato patch as they roamed about, luckily not destroying the plants. I soon figured out what had happened when the cows didn't come into the milking parlor, the manager knew what had happened as he helped me get them in. He said, this afternoon you can expect a visit from Dr. Scully. Well, that afternoon as I was washing the lines, I saw him coming, looking white as a sheet. Then his face turned red and darkened to almost blue. As he opened the door, however, I saw him grin, at which point he must have seen me half dead from fright and simply said, you must be the young man who forgot to close the door this morning. In retrospect, that event became the means of a very good friendship. 
It really tickles me that sometimes comments can be the best response. Like, wow, it looks as though you can hear the crunch of gravel beneath your feet. Or in this case, it looks like you could just walk over there underneath the shade tree and cool down a little bit. Well, now let's step back and take a look for the first time at how unique this painting really is. It took a while in deciding where to extract a companion piece. As with the other barns completed during these two episodes, I was constantly debating whether any of the companion pieces would be effective in the provocation of a response. They seem so elementary to the task. While at the same time, drawing us into the full spectrum of the overall representation, giving us a closer, more touchable magnitude. It probably was the brilliance of contrasting colors that found the facing of the doorway conveying expressionism, so necessary to the likeness of modern art. When combined with the geometric association of design's properties, its depth, illustrated in this painting, literally allows us for the moment to step inside its third dimension. I proceeded to trim the siding boards so they would fit the frame composition, building the painting's depth indicated by the lowered and raised latitude of the space, where the frame actually becomes part of the painting itself. Indeed, quite deliberate in its element of simplicity. It's been pointed out that all these companion pieces heavily support their original paintings, but can also stand on their own. I suppose if that were not the case, they would only represent a piece of the painting, to be brushed away, not holding the duration of our interest. It's not easy standing in the blind of such a time continuum, wondering how or if a work of art would be accepted, but when things do stack up as planned, it can become a rather levitating experience, when in this case there seems to be an extra feature. It speaks of prideful eloquence, as if to charm us with its belonging. This may be due to the addition of silver leaf. I didn't see any reason to record it when I applied the rub and buff waxing technique to the outer strips of the frame. At the time, I did it so I could enjoy the fact that when the painting was finished, well, it would be done. Although this silver leaf effect may be the result of the framing media, these kinds of things are much like the smile of the Mona Lisa, stemming from spontaneity, creating a greater sense of rightness yet non-specific to a recognizable, pre-planned intention. Whatever the case may be, the effect makes us happy in being worthy to claim its attractiveness. No doubt, part of the joy of painting. Well, it looks like our intentions are turning out, unveiling an elegance representing the simple life or a once way of life portrayed here in the dairy barn. A great way of life becoming your own boss and living free. In reviewing these paintings, I believe they fit like hand in glove, truly representing history as a once functioning, state-of-the-art dairy barn. A barn designed to back the truck with the hay right into the upper level, readily available for distribution. These kinds of barns are the precursors of even more scientific ways of farming practice today. Here, the dairy barn and its companion piece, the doorway, certainly convey this place in time. Here on The Creative Connection, we usually reserve the last segment of the show for a musical arrangement, where the intention is to enhance the overall visual experience with a theme song regarding the subject matter content. Where in the case of Missouri Barnes, each piece of artwork represents a part of a cumulative total that best supports the theme song for our show, The Creative Connection. When projects like these are finished, I become very anxious to see how they'll look in a frame or maybe hanging on the wall. Since that's not immediately the case, I simply lean them up at different places in the walkway here in the studio so I can observe and compare them from a distance as well as close up. And, well, I thought I would photograph them that way so you could see them the way that I do. And I'll see you next time.